clapping on one and three. How many of you were clapping on two and four? Two and four over here, huh? They were, too. How many of you don't even care? Okay, well, go ahead and do it your way, then. I don't care. I'm just going to show you how to clap on two and four, but if you don't really care, clap any way you want. We're just praising the Lord. I'm glad I know who Jesus is. Sing it. I'm 
something. We may have started something here. Because when you get back home, I'm going to tell everybody in your church that wasn't here that you shouted. <laughs> Say glory. glory. See, it's not too hard. Do that again. Say glory. Glory. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. We better sing that chorus one more time. Anyway. Oh, hallelujah.
This is the way Christians ought to act. A great celebration, rejoicing in the good things of our beautiful Savior. Brother Williams, would you lead us to the Lord? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for the beautiful spirit that we sense and feel in this place. We thank you, God, for those who have gathered here on this Saturday night looking to you for blessing and for a touch in our lives, for help and for hope. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would meet every heart that is here tonight, that not one person would leave this place, but one Lord Jesus, they have found you to be sufficient in their life, no matter Amen. what the problems praise might God. be or no matter what the trials might be that we face tonight. I pray that you would have your hand upon each and every one of us tonight. As we gather from across this great district, we thank you, Father, for all of our churches and for all of the churches that are represented here tonight and the pastors and, and the wonderful laymen in our churches. And we pray, Lord, that this week would be a highlight that would touch each and every life that would last for all eternity. And I pray, Father, for that one tonight who does not know you personally. I pray Amen. that you would open up their heart to you tonight, Amen. that you would get a hold of their life and transform them and make them new tonight. Amen. I pray for that one tonight who is not filled with your wonderful Holy Spirit. I pray that you would help us, Lord Jesus, to empty ourself of self and to be willing to fill ourselves with you tonight. And I pray, Heavenly Father, you would be with that one who faces a problem and a trial and decision in their life. Oh, God, thank you for your wonderful spirit, the wonderful songs that we've been singing. Lord, it's just a little bit of heaven to go to heaven in. And we thank you tonight for camp meeting and what it means to our families and to our children and to our young people. And thank you, Jesus, for your blessing tonight. And we pray for Virginia Volkman. We pray that you would touch this dear lady, Heavenly Father. And we pray as the great physician, we know we have confidence and assurance tonight, Lord, that you can touch her and you can set her free from the cancer. And we pray that you would do that now as we unite together in prayer, believing and trusting in you tonight, Jesus. And Lord, I pray for this hour, Lord, once again, pray that you would be with our evangelist tonight. Anoint him, God, and may he speak the word that we need to hear tonight. And may we receive what you have for us. And we once again ask your love and your blessing and your strength and your power to fall upon us now in a very wonderful way. And we will give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' wonderful and matchless name we pray. Amen. 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 Most of you don't know me real, real well. And if you did know me real well, you'd know that I have not spoken an awful lot this week. I mean, normally, I talk quite a bit. You can tell that from my voice because I'm losing it. <laughs> but I do want to tell you one thing. This choir up here has been wonderful to me. Amen. Amen. If they don't bless your heart, just watching them. So, I hope you don't feel it bad of me. I've arranged for a large bus. We're taking this choir to Chattanooga with us tomorrow night. Well, even about half of them want to go. I will tell you this, though. Ron Rosing stands before you. Not always a smooth light. Because in the Bible, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. That's what he said. Not maybe, not some of you, not, oh, there's a possibility. You will have trouble. But I love the next part. But he says, fear not, for I have overcome the world. Amen. Praise God. And if you put your trust in that Jesus of mine, I promise you that no matter where you can go in life, he is there with a sustaining hand to pick you up. And stand by you when you need it the most. Amen. Where could I go but to the Lord? Amen. Amen.
Justin and Ron. Ushers, would you prepare yourselves as we receive camp meeting expense offering tonight. You've been faithful. You've been generous. <coughs> Some of you are here for the first time, and uh, we've been picking the pockets of these folk who have been here all week, all week long. And uh, we know that you want to get in on this great offering tonight. I believe in camp meeting. I'm willing to invest my money there. And I know you are too. God bless you as you give. Write a check, Northwestern Illinois District, or put in cash, or whatever. And God will bless you tonight. Father, thank you for this beautiful music and for the message we're going to hear and for the victory so many hearts will receive. Bless this people as they invest in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.
we still have camps we have some district don't even have camps you know they've chosen not to have camp there's nothing necessarily wrong with that I don't guess they you know they've got other ways of doing what we do I guess but I like this brother Bailey and I were talking about I guess yesterday or last night maybe we were talking about the fact that this is kind of the ultimate you just get loose here people come from little churches maybe that don't have any people and they get here and it gets exciting you get blessed and you just kind of discover this is the way it can be at home you know and this is kind of a model so you ought to always pray for your camp that it'd be a real good model you know that God the Holy Ghost will come and walk up and down the aisles of the camp tabernacle and walk up and down the corridors of our hearts and this will always be a great model of what can happen in the holiness church when God's people just do what we do best Amen <laughs> Well, praise God You're glad you're a child of the King Say Amen, amen. <laughs> Glad you came to Saturday night service at Manville Say Amen, amen. Just like to say Amen Say Amen, amen. This is a great crowd. This is one of the funnest camps we ever worked. We worked a lot of camps. Uh, Ron was talking to me last night, and uh, I was just, we, you know, his his tongue is hanging out. <laughs> this is a lot like work, you know, especially what he's doing. You know, that choir. He just he puts himself in it. And and I said, you know, when we were at this all the time, six years, we we end one on Sunday night. And a lot of times on Monday night, I had to be in Philadelphia or somewhere to start another, you know. And you go maybe 10, 12, 14 weeks a summer, one after another, after another, after another, and every day off, just keep going. Uh, I get to where I see camp meetings in my sleep. But I love the camp meeting. Amen. And we love you. Amen. We love Northwestern Illinoisans. We were here not long ago for your ladies retreat, and we had a camp meeting on small scale at the Brown, you know, Brown Building. What, what do you call it? Brown, Brown Memorial. Memorial Chapel. Amen. Oh, we just love you. It's good to be with you. Um, I really struggled with what I ought to preach tonight. You know, I just don't know sometimes. I have on occasion in my church at home just got up on Sunday morning, we'd get through with this kind of music um, and when it was all over we were so wired and so blessed and God had been there and you know people had shouted and testified and prayed at the altar and that kind of stuff and I just, you know, time to preach I just said, ah, I go home I don't want to preach today <laughs> I'm not sure that's altogether a bad idea sometimes right. you know, just going home right. I don't mean not, not now I mean, <laughs> Uh, we preach our little sermons. I don't ever, I don't ever want to be guilty of just absolutely feeling like I have to preach my little two two bit sermon. You know, God has so many ways of doing what He has to do. You know? Amen. And the neat thing about Nazarene altars, they're always open. You know. If during the music you get blessed or you get feeling the need to come and pray, you just get up out of your seat and come while the singing is going on or when somebody's testifying or Amen. whatever, you know, you just get help and God can work in so many marvelous ways. How many of you are here this morning? Um, <coughs> Philip McAllister from Ireland stood and preached in my place this morning at my request. I wanted to hear the sermon he preached this morning. And he got just about one fourth of the way through and felt, I could sense, definitely impressed, overwhelmed of the Spirit to extend a very unique invitation. And I am absolutely convinced, for those who were here, it was one of the high points of the whole week. Amen. It was just a very unique. 
I thank God for his obedience. Amen. I'm convinced that we can just be obedient to God. Great things can happen. I think I want to take you to a passage of scripture that brings us to reality. I was telling Kim Smith in the bookstore a few minutes ago, I, I was uh, the recipient uh, a few days ago of the entire library of Dr. Glenn Jones, who was the district superintendent in East Tennessee, and he was in Oklahoma some years ago, and Glenn Jones was a great preacher, and he died a few years ago and went to heaven, and his wife is a member of my church, and she was about to move to Oklahoma, and she called me over and said, Brother Wells, I want you to have everything of Glenn's. I want you to have his sermon material. I want you to have all of his books. And, and I'm telling you, I absolutely inherited an, an unbelievable wealth Amen. of holiness literature. Amen. I don't know how I'll ever get it all read. It's just walls and walls. And, you know. I was talking to a kid that's two hours from dropping, from finishing uh, an undergraduate degree at Trebekah College a few days ago, and he was talking to me about all that he had learned while he had been in school and the conflicting views and positions. And, you know, sometimes in theology and in the church, we can begin to split hairs on things, and we try to evaluate how many angels can dance on the head of a pen and, you know, some of that real deep and meaningful stuff. <laughs> And if we are not careful, it's easy for us to forget some very major and basic premises of the Word. Amen. Just skate right on, on by them in an attempt to try to just dig into something theologically or philosophically. And we just miss some things that are very basic to the Gospel. And if it's okay, and I can just be absolutely elementary tonight, I want to go to the 16th chapter of Luke. And I want to read a passage of Scripture that tells the story of two men, and it has very few options, and you have very few directions to go. It's just so simple and so basic, and, and I don't know if it would be worth anything to you, but it may be a reminder to all of us of some things that we really need to hear. We'll start reading with verse 9, excuse me, verse 19, where it says, There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously, or lived extravagantly every day. Colon. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. Which was laid at his, his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died. And was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died, and was buried, and in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torments, and see if Abraham were far off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he's comforted, and thou art tormented. Beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from here to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from there. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send Lazarus to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear that. They have the preaching of the word, let them hear that. And he said, No, Father Abraham, you don't know my brothers. They won't listen to preaching. 
But if one went unto them from the dead, if somebody raised from the dead and went to them, they'll repent. He said unto, unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. <coughs> Thus reads God's word in those remaining verses of the 16th chapter. It is intriguing to me that there are only two, per, two, two major players in this, in this uh, saga. This story. There are only two major, major characters. A rich man and a beggar. It speaks to us of the reality that really there are only two ways to live. And every person under the sound of my voice tonight is living in one of these two categories. You're either living for Jesus or you're living against him. Amen. You're gathering or you're scattering. You're serving God or mammon. Can't serve both, must serve one. Will love one, hate the other. Or hate one and cleave to the other. In this area there is really no gray ground. There are only two places of eternal destiny mentioned in this story. I've often said I wish that I could tell you tonight that there are ten levels of heaven and ten levels of eternal torment. I wish I could tell you that if you have been born again but you don't go to church regularly and you don't pay your tithes and you don't support the church and you vote no on a lot of things on the board, you go to heaven but you just, you know, you, you don't go all the way up, you just go part of the way. Or if you have not been born again but you're a good moral person, you don't go really to, to, to the depths of hell, you just go to Hell number one, it's not really too hot, but it's not, you know, it's not air conditioned, but it's not, it's not all the way down. You know. If you're a little more benighted, a little tougher lifestyle, a little worse, you know, you go to hell number two. And, and of course, uh, hell number three will be reserved for those who are a little bit more benighted. And, and then, then there is that lowest place where Saddam Hussein and Adolf Hitler and Jim Jones and Charles Manson will be. Of course, in the levels of heaven, there would be the first level and then the second level and third level. And, of course, the level number 10 be reserved for itinerant evangelists and missionaries. <laughs> <laughs> but the real truth is that there are not any levels. It's just heaven. You Amen. just make it or you, or you don't make it. Amen. There are just two places of eternal destiny. Amen. I think it's important for us to realize that. There's a third truth that is spoken between the lines of this story, and that's the fact that the rich man died, the beggar died, and it's a universal truth. Everybody in the sound of my voice one of these days is going to either die or leave this world by way of the rapture. Sure. If you live long enough and the Lord tarries is coming, you may live old enough that you wish you could die. But trust me, you will. Everybody's going to die. It's a universal truth. That's not hard to understand, is it? Yeah, right. Just basically. Two ways to live. Two places of eternal destiny. Everybody must die. I want to talk tonight just a little bit about those two places of eternal destiny. But first I want to talk about the destiny of the, of the rich man. I want to talk to you about hell. I don't ever preach on hell like I've heard the hell preached on. I was not raised in the church of Nazarene. I was raised in a, another denomination. They were pretty graphic. I mean, I remember the revival. Saturday night was hell, fire, and damnation preaching night. You know, you go to the revival on Saturday night, you could count on hearing about hell on Saturday night. I've seen evangelists that rig up a box full of chains in the bottom of the pulpit. And on cue, they'd pay a kid a quarter to turn the lights out and turn the church as black as midnight. They'd scream about hell and drag those chains out of those boxes. And then, you know, when the music would play and the people would be wailing and praying, turn the lights back on. Man, I mean, people were wall to wall seeking God. Praying, oh God, don't let me slide off into hell tonight. The problem is when you are, when it's possible to scare you into it, it 
won't take much for the devil to talk you out of it tomorrow. So I don't spend a lot of time with that. I think there's more to this than all. Yeah. But there are some things in the Word that I just want to draw to your attention. I want to talk about it just a little while. Verse 24, there are two words that really intrigue me. You might just highlight them or underscore them. When you read this passage later, remember this. The two words in verse 24, the two words have mercy. The rich man in hell cried out for mercy. He said, just send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. Just have mercy. And that's really not a strange request. I probably would cry the same thing, but the strangeness of this of these words in this context is that they are they are denied. There was no mercy available for him. And that's hard for me to fathom because we live in a world where mercy is is, is absolutely flowing like a river and God's mercy and God's grace tonight in this tabernacle is flowing like the Niagara River and I remember when I went to the Niagara Falls some years ago, took the family up there I never saw a more astonishing sight in all of my life and they say that something like 37 million gallons of water per second fall over that thing and I watched as it splashed the bottom and the mist rose and the, the rainbows perpetually hung over that falls and we got in a little boat down the bottom they called the main of the mist and we rode around on the river down below and we went right up to the falls and I thought while I was down there and the water splashing in my face what a marvelous flow of water this is and I can take my little cup and hold it under that water and get a drink of that crystal clear pure water and I can hold it under there again and get more water and it's not quite like manville water I mean you could hold it under again and, and you can hold it under there again and you just never get tired of that crystal clear, pure, cold water. And I could call all of my friends in from all over the United States and they could come and we could all hold our cup under that fall and we could just drink and drink and drink and drink our fill and we could never begin to deplete the supply of water coming over the falls. And I was on that little boat watching all that got blessed and thought about how God's mercy and grace tonight is absolutely flowing like a river. And you can put your little cup under the falls of God's mercy and the falls of His grace and you can take a drink and put it under there and take another drink and put it under there and take another drink and another and another and drink until you have drunk your fill and you can call your brothers and your sisters and your neighbors and your moms and dads and gather all the kids up and they can all just drink from the rivers of God's mercy and grace. Because the mercy doors are wide open tonight. Mercy flows like a river. But there's coming a day when the mercy door will close. It's as real as life. Verse 25. I'm hurrying it. Can you tell? Are you glad? Verse 25. One word. Remember. He said, remember in your lifetime, you had good things, Lazarus had evil things, but now he's comforted and you're tormented. Remember. Remember your lifetime. It makes me realize that in hell there will be memory. I don't know what that means to you, but that really gets to me. I've thought about a place of painful, awful memories in hell. If I was to go to hell, I wondered what would be the things that I would remember. Well, I don't know about you, but I think probably for me at the top of the list would be the, the sound the sound of a mother and dad praying for me. I think if I was to be lost in the regions of the damned, I would, I would literally be haunted forever with the sounds of mom and dad praying for me. I remember when I was a wayward teenage kid, away from God, and I decided I was going to go my own way, and I paid no attention to it the wooings of God, and I just kind of made my own decision. I was going away from God just as quick as I could. I can remember coming in at night, sometime too late, and I'd try to sneak in the house to be sure Dad didn't know it, because if my dad, you know, these teenagers don't, it's hard for you to understand. In those days, we had what they called a curfew. Yeah. <laughs> Did any of you, have, have, have any, any of you ever heard that word? There are a few that just kind of have a puzzled look. You kind of seem like in memory there was something about all that. I hear people talking about, you know, their 14, 13, 14 year old kids. They say, yeah, we, we're, we're pretty tough on her. We've given her a curfew. She's got to be in by 2 in the morning. <laughs> I remember when I had to get 
in by 10 o'clock and my dad tell me as it's going out the door he said that does not mean 10 01 and that does not mean on the porch that means in the house Sometimes I'd come in late and I'd been out doing things I probably shouldn't do and I'd try to sneak in the house and try to, you know, pray that the Lord would make me light where the floor wouldn't squeak and maybe mom and dad be in bed sleeping. But I don't know, before I got away from home, before I got married, got away from home, my dad and mother were like God, they never slept. I can call them anytime now, day or night, my dad and mother be asleep all the time, anytime I ever call them. Boy, they didn't sleep in those days. I'd come in, it didn't make any difference. They'd be awake. Right. I remember Brother Hollis going by my dad and mom's bedroom. Sometimes I'd just try to, try to sneak by, and I'd hear the sound of them praying in the bedroom. Amen. Praise God. And they'd be calling my name. And I really believe that I'm in the kingdom largely tonight because of a praying dad and a praying mom. Amen. And the sound of praying parents would haunt me in hell, I believe. I've been in some of the greatest services that that have, that have ever been. These services this week, this kind of stuff. I believe if I'd go to hell, I'd remember these services like it was on video. I believe I'd see the preachers. I believe I'd hear the music. I believe I'd hear the great sermons. I believe I'd hear the marvelous, the messages that, that had told me what could have happened. I believe that it would, have, it would be perpetual reminder to me. And in hell, I believe my memory would haunt me with things like the sounds of services and songs and and sermons and that kind of thing. And memory in hell would be a, a horrible thing. I don't I don't I don't need to talk about flames and fire and white hot heat that's so white it's black and I don't understand all that. Horrible memories would haunt me in hell. Verse 26. It speaks of a great gulf fixed between the lost and the saved. Final separation. Tough. I don't know, anybody here raised like I was? My dad was a preacher. We went everywhere, you know, we moved everywhere. We lived in a lot of different places. But my grandparents always lived, my, my paternal grandparents lived in Kansas City. And my maternal grandparents lived in Louisville, Kentucky. So every year when we were on our way to the General Assembly in the Church of God, we'd stop by for a week and spend a week with my grandparents in Kansas City. And then we'd go to my grandparents in Louisville and stay for another week. Then we'd go on to Cleveland, Tennessee to the General Assembly. We'd stay for a week and then go home. I can remember going into my grandparents in Kansas first. And, oh, we always loved to see my grandmother. She had snow white hair. And she's now 91 years old and still lives in Kansas City. She was a minister and... And uh, my, my grandfather, I was named after him, and I was the only boy grandson in the family to carry on the name. And I was about the most special thing in all the world to him, you know. And, and uh, we'd go see my grandparents. We always loved to get there. But about two days before it was time to leave, I began to go, you know, go try to find a place to hide. Because I knew leaving time was coming. And I knew that horrible feeling when you had to leave. I think partially because my grandmother was a weeper. She couldn't just walk out the street and say, well, we'll see you next year going in the house. She'd just cry. And with con contorted face, she'd, she'd hug you again and again and again. It was like eternity every time you left. And she didn't just walk out of the car. She'd walk out into the street in Kansas City and wave both hands. As far as you can see her down the road, you see her wave both hands, waving goodbye. We'd ride, we'd just, just ride and cry for 150 miles. <laughs> I hate goodbyes. Yeah. My sister and I got married, moved away from home. Nancy and I went down there to visit. She and her husband, Fendi, and I got ready to leave. And I said, I'm going to tell you one thing, Helen. I'm going to leave here. I'm going to come and see you, and I'm going to leave. But if you cry like Grandma, I'm never coming back. I'm never coming back. I hate goodbyes. I just hate it. But I'm going to tell you something. When you plant a kiss on the cold form yeah. of a dead loved one who died without Jesus, that goodbye is an eternal goodbye. It's an eternal
eternal Amen. separation. And that terrifies me. <laughs> Verses 27 and 28 tell me something else that's kind of unique about hell. It speaks to us of a new compassion that this man, this rich man, for, had for his lost family, his, his five brothers. He prayed, send Lazarus back that he may preach to my five brothers so they'll, they'll be able to, to be diverted, not come to this place of torment. He said, just send Lazarus back that he can preach to my five brothers. And, and I don't know what their relationship was in this world, but when he got to hell... He started praying, and I want to tell you, I've thought of hell as a lot of things, but I've never thought of hell as a place that would house a prayer meeting. But the Bible indicates with clarity that Dives prayed in, in hell for his five brothers, and I'm going to tell you, he prayed like none of us have prayed for this service, like none of us have prayed for this camp meeting, like none of us probably prayed very often. He prayed with a sense of urgency because he knew where they were going, and he said, do whatever is necessary. And, and Father Abraham called back, and he said, well, they have the preaching of the word. They can get saved any time they want to. He said, no, 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 it's going to take more than that. He said, if somebody, if somebody would be raised from the dead and come back and tell them what, what a horrible place that there is waiting them. He said, maybe they would be turned, but they won't be turned by just preaching. He, he was terribly compassionate for his five brothers, and hell became the, the house of a prayer meeting. I've often prayed, oh God, on Sunday morning, I'm getting ready to go to the pulpit on Sunday morning. I've often prayed, God, help me to pray like people are praying in hell. Help me to pray with that kind of urgency. Help me to preach like a dying man to dying men. Amen. Help me to preach with a broken heart. Amen. Realizing that some who are sitting here tonight are playing around the peripheral ring of the church and you're playing church games but you're, re you're really not right with Jesus and you have, you have things in your life that really don't need to be there. And, and I prayed before I came over here tonight, Lord Jesus, help me to preach tonight like a dying man to dying men because one of these days we're going to leave this world and it's going to be too late to do anything about it. But I want you to notice that the request for the supernatural was denied. He said, send Lazarus back. Let him raise from the dead and come walking down the church aisle on Sunday morning with his grave clothes on. Let him just walk down the aisle of the church with his grave clothes on. And if my five brothers see that old beggar that died come back to life, they'll hear him. Don't you listen. The answer came ringing back. If they won't hear the preaching of the gospel, they wouldn't be persuaded if ten rose from the dead. Right. Amen. And I read over there in another place where Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God Amen. unto salvation. Amen. And I want you to know tonight what you are hearing, the truth of life and death and eternity and heaven and hell. It's an adequate sermon to get you home. And as bad as I hate to declare it, it just doesn't get much better than this. Amen. God probably is not going to send bolts of fire down your pew or lightning into your home. And he's probably not going to speak to you in audible tones through sermons like these and these that we've heard all week. And the ministry of the blessed Holy Ghost, he comes down your aisle and he comes down your pew and he comes down in th through, the, through the hallways of your heart and he speaks to you. I remember when he spoke to me for the very first time as a little boy and I could never get away from the haunting sound of the Holy Ghost speaking to me. It was not audible and I never saw lights flash and I never heard bells ring and you know, there are a lot of our people that's sitting around and they really know they're not where they need to be with God, but they say, one of these days the service is going to get wild enough and one of these days God's going to speak to me in tones that I can understand and one of these days when, and when they sing just as I am 27 times and Grandma's there, my mom and dad are there, everything's right and all the planets are in line and everything's right, I'm going to give my heart to Jesus. Well, I'm going to tell you, it probably won't happen. Because the plain, simple gospel of Jesus, if that's not enough to wound and break your heart, your heart probably won't be broken. The 
simple love of Jesus. And I want you to notice too that the answer came ringing back in terms of individual responsibility. You know, <coughs> this man could not could not pray through for his five lost brothers. You know, I have a sister. I have only one sister who lives in Louisiana. I love with all my heart. I'm not really sure where she is with Jesus tonight. I'm, I'm, to be very honest, I'm very troubled. I have been for years. If I, I, I've often wished that I had some kind of a powder after I preach that I could walk down the aisles and when I see somebody resisting God, I could just sprinkle some powder on you and you say, oh yes, I think I'll go. But I don't have it. God won't use that kind of stuff. No, no, we're not in the business of high-pressure sales here. That, that's why I think probably the tactics of human manipulation really bother me. Because when we're when we're the, when we're, there, we're in this business, really, I think that's too too human and too carnal, and it really bothers me. Human manipulation from the pulpit, and we try to trick people into coming to Jesus. And that's just like this this hot hell preaching. You know, I, I'm not sure trying to scare people into the kingdom is the right way. The gospel is adequate. Amen. And you have individual responsibility. And the truth is, you can go to hell out of a camp meeting or you can go to heaven out of very adverse circumstances and nobody in the world makes the choice but you. Right. Amen. You make your choice. Right. Are you listening? Look, look right in my eyes. I'm going to tell you something. You hold your eternal destiny in your hands. Amen. And it doesn't make any difference who your dad was or who your mom was. You say, well, I didn't grow up in a Christian home and I haven't had the advantages. And there's not a good church in my town. The little church in my town doesn't amount to anything too much. And I don't know if I'll ever make it. I want you to know that you have you hold your eternal destiny in your two hands and you can make it if you want to. God's grace has been provided to, to take you all the way home. But, but it's an individual proposition and every one of us will have to make that choice. Amen. The Bible says that the rich man died and was buried. It doesn't say one word about Lazarus being buried. It just said the beggar died. We don't even know what happened to his old disease carcass. We really don't know what the story is of Lazarus. But we can pretty, we can pretty well put the Put the icing on the cake about this rich man, you know. You ever go to a rich man's funeral? You ever been to a rich man's funeral? Man, it's a big deal. You know, hundreds of people go to a rich man's funeral. There'll be, there'll be flowers there for people he didn't even know. They'll have a half a dozen guys get up and come to the platform and behind the pulpit and eulogize him and talk about how benevolent he was and what a great guy he was. You go to a rich man's funeral, it's a big deal. You know. You ever been to a real, real poor man's funeral? Nancy used to play the organ for a funeral home when we passed from Macon, Georgia some years ago and there was a retired Baptist preacher who was the mortician there. You know, he, he ran that funeral home and once in a while, he'd call Nancy and just say, we got a county deal today, and there's no family. And it'd be a very simple ceremony, but he kind of had a he kind of had a heart for the poor. So he'd take the flowers from another funeral that were kind of left over, and he'd set them up. And he'd bring a little cheap casket in there. And he'd preach a little sermon, a little funeral sermon. And Nancy would play the organ to an empty chapel. Nobody there. A lot of times I'd go with her and just kind of sit back there in empty chapel. Nobody there. 
I just think about a whole life. And he left this world and nobody noticed or cared. A lot of times my mind would roll back to the death of Lazarus the beggar. <laughs> There's not any telling how long he lay dead before somebody recognized that he was dead. We had no idea. But I want you to listen to me. The Bible says though he had nothing, though he lived a life of abject poverty, and though he was a very sick man, and though nobody in the world cared very much about him, the Bible said when the beggar died, God commissioned a company of angels to go serve as his pallbearer. Amen. Amen. And I believe by the time he died, Praise God. his uh, never dying spirit was heaven bound. Time his old weary head hit the ground, his spirit was on its way heavenward. You hear me tonight. This life, at the very best, is very short. And eternity is very long. And there's an awful, horrible hill to shine. And there is a marvelous, resplendent heaven to come. Amen. The Bible said he, he died sick. He had sores all over his body. He had no medicine. The only medication he had was when the saliva of the dogs, and they'd come by and make those open wounds. He died sick. But he woke up well. Amen. 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 Praise God. Amen. He died hurting. But he woke up painless. Praise God. Man. A lot of people get revved up over heaven because of golden streets. They want to go see golden streets. I see people in the church that are like kids going to Disneyland. They want to go to heaven so they can see the stuff. <laughs> golden streets. Man, do you know how little I care about golden streets? I'll get to heaven. I live close to Dalton, Georgia. When I get to heaven, I'll probably want a car for them. <laughs> golden streets don't mean anything to me. Translucent gold. It's, it's so pure that the light can shine through it. I don't even understand that. The Bible said the walls are of jasper. And right. They are the capital city of the New Jerusalem is 1,500 miles square and 1,500 miles high. Yeah. And the walls are that high on 12 different stories. Right. And the Bible says that there are 12 gates and each gate is a pearl. I was watching public television the other day and saw in a motel room and I saw on one of those public television shows the largest pearl known to man. It's a great big thing. It was asymmetrical. It was not spherical and it was rippled and ugly and they were pushing it in a, in a wheelbarrow and I was in that motel room. I got blessed half to death. I got to thinking about it somewhere. God has created an oyster large enough to cultivate a pearl that he can slice and make gates out of in heaven. Amen. And not just one, but three on the north, and three on the south, and three on the east, and three on the west. Right. And they're never closed. Right. They're open day and night. Right. You don't have to worry about burglars. There's no sun there. There's no need of the sun there because the Lamb is the light of the city. Sure. Amen. Pearl Gates. Can you can you get a grip on that? Lawrence Hicks preached in Chattanooga, Tennessee. You know he was the. He was the great southern orator, the Nazarene, years ago. And he used to talk about pearl gates on bejeweled hinges. Yeah. I think he made that part of it. I'm not sure now. Boy, he's a great preacher. Sure. He 
talk about heaven, talk about all that stuff. But tell you the truth, I read in the Word where it says, when we get to heaven, there will be no pain. I look at people who are physical pain. I think about that little 15-year-old boy laying in that Indianapolis hospital tonight who is as absolutely as sharp as a briar. He is a brilliant kid. And he's gone through this horrible tragedy. And he's gaining a little ground, but it's very slow, and he's comatose, and he's, his family is racked with sorrow and pain. And then I think about in heaven, there will be none of that. Right. Amen. There will be no sorrow. For God will wipe every tear from our eyes. There will be no more pain. There will be no more night. Amen. Amen. There will be no more death. There will be no more tempter. Subsequently, there will be no more confusion. Amen. And there will be no more sin. And there will be no more sickness. Are you ready for this? Buckle your seatbelt. I don't know how this revs your motor, but I'm going to tell you what it does for me. <laughs> there will be no more party. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> well, glory to God. And we'll say hello. Never say goodbye again. Amen. Amen. <laughs> it's available. Amen. <laughs> it's available. And I'm going to tell you, I've made up my mind. I am going to get there. My God's heaven. And I want to take everybody with me today. Starting with my family. I can't make their choices for them. But I'm doing everything a dad can do to influence kids toward the city of God. Amen. I about made up my mind that no hard feelings are worth going to hell over. I used to be so egotistical and I used to have to have my way and I, you know, I just thought it was God's way and I, you know, I've got to wear, i got to be careful and I just don't get so laid back people can just do anything, I, you know. I'm going to tell you, if you come up to me tonight and say, you're a terrible preacher, I'll say that's two of us that vote that way. <laughs> Pray for me that I'll do better. I've been kicked around, but it's kind of getting it's getting pretty tough for you to hurt my feelings because I've kind of calloused and I've kind of disconnected from this world, and I've about decided that nothing in this world, or no breach in relationships, or no dumb position on a board or something, is worth losing my soul over. And I'm going to get to heaven, whatever it costs me. And it really doesn't make any difference what the cost is. I've got to get home. I've hey, got man. to get home. Sure. Praise God. I'm just kind of getting loosened from this world. Amen. I, hey, I said the other night I wouldn't go, I wouldn't cross the street and give a nickel to see an ant eat a bale of hay. I just this world has no appeal for me. <laughs> I'm just not hooked. I, I'm just not hooked. I remember my old, my old granddad just before he died. He was 96. Kentucky. He's the one I told about the last time I was here that ate biscuits and red-eye gravy and country ham and all that stuff every morning until he died. You know, when he died, the doctor said the cholesterol finally got him at 96. <laughs> he was such a neat guy. I wish everybody in the world could have known my grandfather because, you know, he was he was so attached to the the, the heavenly world and there was such a pull on his soul that that there was there was very little attachment left in this world and and you know in, in, in his in his late years you might say to my grandfather John your 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 eyes are, are failing it seems and 
And he tells you, no, 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 my eyes are not, not failing. My focus is just changing. Right. Right. I used to look at things close up, but now I'm seeing things afar. Amen. Sure. Amen. You might say to him, John, your hearing's getting kind of kind of faulty. And he'd say to you, no, no, no. The angels have just closed the windows on the street side so that I can more readily hear the heavenly music. Amen. You might say that to, to him, John, your hair is turning a bit to silver. And he'd say, well, that's no problem because I'm about to wear a crown of righteousness and my hair is just kind of taking on a tint that's agreeable to the color scheme. <laughs> you might say, well, John, your house is about gone. It's leaning and there's not much house there and not much, you know. And he'd tell you very quickly, oh, this is not my home. Yeah, my name's recorded on the deed, and it's uh, recorded the courthouse, and, and it's my home here, but it's just very temporal, and I'm just kind of a pilgrim passing through this world, and I really have been making payments on a real house on the other side. So year after year after year after year after year, I've been preparing myself for what, what is to come. Don't worry about me because I'm going home. Amen. He died in 96. My, my uncle, who's living with, he moved out of his house one week before he died. He knew he was going to die. I really believe that. And he moved in my uncle. And my uncle called me at 2 o'clock in the morning. He said, Gene, I've just been trying to get a hold of your mom, and we can't get a hold of your mom. Uh, I hate to wake you, but i got to get a hold of your mom and let her know that your granddad died just about an hour ago. And I said, while it's fresh on your mind, if you don't care to take the time, tell me right now how it was the last few hours. Amen. Time I get there, you will have gotten busy with other things, you'll forget it. Tell me right now, 2.30 in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. He said the last day he walked about three miles, came in, this daughter-in-law had prepared hamburgers for supper, and he ate his hamburger, and then he told her, he said, Merlene, tell you the truth, I'm not much of a hamburger person. Don't ever fix me hamburgers again. <laughs> <laughs> My uncle said, seemed like before I went to bed that night, Dad just wanted to talk on and on and on. And he said he was talking about how good God had been. All the things that happened in life and how God had always been faithful and how God had been true, 96 years old, and he's on the firing line talking about how great God is. He said, I had to take care of something not long ago. I had bad feelings for this fellow, and I had to make restitution and get it all fixed. And he was just talking all about it. He said, about 9, 30, 10 o'clock, I just said, Dad, I've got to go to bed. I've got to get up and work in the morning. So he said, Dad consented. We went to bed. And he said, about 1.30... My wife kind of nudged me and said, I think I just saw your dad go by the bedroom door. And he said, I got up and went in. There was your grandpa dressed up in his Sunday clothes with shoes on and tied, head laid back, going to heaven. <laughs> I thought to myself, there is absolutely nothing in this world that's worth enough for us to miss heaven. We've got to make it. We've got to make it. Well, praise God. we got to make it. Glory to God. Stand with you.
This, this boy in, in Indianapolis, 15 years old. One minute, everything's fine. The next minute, he's suspended between life and death. And, and we have no control over all it. it. It just behooves all of us to be ready. And I ask you, are you ready? Church members, Nazarenes, the best of the best, are you ready if the Lord would come or call for you tonight? Oh, I wish I had three hours to preach tonight. I just wish I had time. I'm, I'm so comfortable. It seemed that God is here. and Oh, I just wish that I had more time. I, I'm, I'm overwhelmed with this sense of urgency. Are, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Is there any little situation in the church that's kind of got you in a bind? And, and really be honest, you, you really are not comfortable if the Lord would come or call that everything, you know, it would be terrible for the Lord to come or call for you if you just have one little thing you really need to take care of. Because that's, that's maybe all it would take to cost you heaven. And to be lost forever. Amen. Who cares whether the carpet's green or blue? Who cares whether you got elected the board or not? Who cares whether they really recognize your value? Huh. <laughs> Who cares? You're not worth being lost. We're going to start to sing in just a minute. A song that says, What a day that will be. And if you have any doubt about where you stand spiritually, Maybe you're not vaccinated, but you just have some doubts. You just got some things you really need to talk to Jesus about and you can take, get taken care of. You just really need to come. When we start to sing, I want you to come from everywhere. If you've got any doubt at all, I want you to get out of your seat and come. Teenagers, if you have any doubt about your salvation, if you have any doubt about your eternal destiny, I want you to get out tonight and come and pray until you have the, the assurance that everything is okay. There's another group that I want to come to the altar. Heaven awaits. Eternal punishment awaits some. Some of you have loved ones. But tonight, deep in your heart, you're terribly burdened. I don't mean just praying for the whole world, but I mean you got you got a loved one. A loved one on your heart that is absolutely about to break your heart. And I think tonight would be a great time to just get out of your seat. If you, have, if you have somebody that's really on your heart, come and just kneel somewhere. Spend 20 minutes talking to Jesus about all of that. While we sing, whatever the needs are, we don't know what the needs are. I'm not keeping score. God knows about all this. Amen. While we sing, you just come and God will meet your need. Will you do it? What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see
to you. I'll tell you, the Lord wants to meet needs tonight. I really believe that. He really wants to meet needs tonight. Is your heart clear? Is everything okay? Have you taken care of everything? Is there anybody else that just needs to pray tonight? We'll make room. I'm telling you, we'll make room. We're about we're about out of room. We're right, right around the altar, but we'll we'll make altar space out of all this front. I have good news for you. The Lord's not just confined to the altar space. He can get to to you where you are. Right back there, He can get to you. Don't worry about it. I've seen people just turn around back there and kneel back there, and it's okay. The Lord get to you. He knows where you are. He's already gotten to you. And He can help you. He can help you all the way through this situation. And if you really need help, we sing it again. If somebody else needs to come to the altar, if somebody else needs to come to the altar, I want you to get on out of there and come while we sing again. Oh, what a day.